You might be wondering why I'm here to talk to you today. And the biggest reason is when I was your age, my life kind of sucked. And so I thought, well, now that I'm older and I'm doing exactly what I enjoy, I'd like to talk to kids your age to let you know that if you're going through some hard times, life most likely is gonna not only get better, but if you make good decisions, it's gonna get awesome. The biggest thing I wanna ask you guys right now is, what do you guys want to do in life? What do you enjoy doing? What do you want to do more of as you get older? Yes? Um, ride dirt bikes. Ride dirt bikes. Do you want to race motocross? I like the way you think. Yes. Building what? Architecture. Architecture. You? Engineer? MBA. Nice. NFL. So what I'm going to tell you are things that I learned. So I'm going to be telling you a lot of stories about what I went through. And I hope instead of you just thinking I'm talking about me is that I'm telling stories that you can identify with. So I want you guys to go, oh, my life's kind of like that. And then you can start planning, hey, if he can do that, maybe I can do that. So a lot of the things I'm telling you that I experienced, because I only know them because I experienced them, but I'm hoping you guys get your own ideas off of that. Does that make sense? My dream when I was your age was to travel the world and do things that kind of risk my life, but not die or not get hurt. So you guys want to see some videos of what I've been doing in the last few years? Yeah. All right, here we go. So this is a couple of things. This yeah. is a, a uranium mine in Colorado. Oh, got it. You done? No, I want to work the rest of the day. Yeah. Probably got 20 seconds. Four, three, two. Three, two, one. You lied to me. Oh, I was wrong. We had about a minute and a half. Ah, oh, come on. So watch our clothes. Plug in. <laughs> You heard the delays there. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. then you could feel the shockwave go out the tunnel and back in. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> Woo, I gotta go change my pants. <laughs> well, let's go check out and see what one of these blasts can uh, remove. And we add just a little bit of melt water into it. This, this is, is what happens. Water into fire in ice. Whoa! And that's the explosive power of water. When it turns to steam, it expands 1,600 times the original size. And it's that that pulverized that ash sending it high into the atmosphere and all over Europe, shutting down international travel. Jeez, that's hot. Ah, to its melting point. And to make this experiment much more realistic, I have to flip the camera over. And so now imagine this heat coming deep within the earth. Now watch what this stuff does when it starts to become liquid. And there it goes. Just think of every one of these drips. This giant body of magma rising to the surface of the Earth. So using the same heat source from within the Earth, we're going to see what kind of temperatures it takes to actually get this granite to do anything. So imagine... That's granite from Mount Lemmon. ...to work its way through plumbing and get towards the surface of the Earth. It doesn't work. It plugs up all those pipes, builds up that pressure. And it's this that gets very explosive. So here we can actually see those ash falls. And since we see these large boulders, we can tell that this was a very volatile eruption. And so what we're doing is with this plastic tub is we're simulating a loaded cargo ship. So cargo ships are filled with goods to the point where there's just a little bit of them sitting above the surface. So we really don't know what's gonna happen. It could go down because of the density change. It could go up because of that vertical water flow coming up, or it could just tip over on the edge of the bubble. Ready to do this? I'm ready. All right. So we put a dry ice bomb underwater. So we put a big air bubble coming up. You ready? <laughs> Look at that! It's like a magic trick, just gone. So does that stuff look like fun? Yeah. yeah. And so that's what I dreamt when I was your age. I wanted to travel around the world and I wanted to do all kinds of crazy experiments. You guys think I'm kind of living my dreams now? Yeah. yeah. So what I'd like to do is kind of teach you guys with some real simple stuff what I learned at your age to hopefully do exactly what you want. Because you guys just told me what you want to become in life, right? Yeah. 
And so I've talked to Ava and I'm gonna come back in 20 years and make sure every one of you guys is doing what she told me. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But let me tell you what my life was like when I was about your age, okay? So when I was your age, so this is what, you know, everybody has all their friends, but because we traveled a bit more as a family, I didn't have friends, you know? You come to a new school and everybody's buddy-buddy and it's always that new kid that doesn't get friends. So does anybody like this? Does anybody kind of feel like a loser? I'm not gonna ask for hands, but those people that feel like a loser, I wanna tell you guys that believe it or not, it's a good thing. And so because I didn't have friends, you know, I didn't have to go to the bathroom with my 10 best friends. I didn't need four people to go to the movies. I, I was forced to become independent. So if any of you guys are feeling like a loser, you're not popular, you, you don't wear the nice clothes, or you can't afford them like I couldn't, and you just don't fit in, I'm first here to tell you guys that that's awesome. Is that a weird message? It is, isn't it? But you guys are the people that will literally be running the world later on in life because you don't need anybody else to show you or help you go in the direction you want to go. And so nowadays, I can just pick up a backpack, go anywhere around the world I want to, because I don't have to fit into those friendships back when I was your age. So I hope the people here that don't feel like they fit in, I hope the first thing you learn is that you're in a really good position. And you'll be, you know, by being in that position, you're learning to be a very independent thinker, and that's powerful. But the big thing I used to love to do was experiment with stuff. So one of the crazy things is I learned there's only three ingredients to gunpowder. And with my parents' permission, I'm gonna say that one more time, with my parents' permission, they let me get those three ingredients and make my own gunpowder. Isn't that crazy? And so right here, I'm grinding the gunpowder together, and then I got to basically make my own rocket engines, test my own fireworks, do all kinds of stuff once I figured out gunpowder. So that was just me looking into it, going to the library. For you guys, it would be getting on YouTube. If you guys got your parents' permission, you could do all kinds of cool stuff. Another thing I got into was flight. So I was into model airplanes, then I even tried to make my own hang glider. You guys think this turned out pretty good? No. So I ran off the roof of the house, jumped off, and what do you guys think happened? The wings folded up instantly, and I sprained both ankles. But luckily, I didn't break any bones. The other thing I found out was that if you go to a scrap yard, no matter what the shape is, they sell you by the pound of that metal. And so right now at a scrap yard, steel is like 30, 32 cents a pound. And so I was able to buy an entire go-kart for like five bucks, but it was busted, right? Somebody scrapped it out because it was busted. But because I was starting to dream big, I figured I bet some of my neighbors know how to weld. So I started knocking on doors. My neighbor was a retired welder, had nothing to do. So all of a sudden, together we rebuilt the go-kart. But it didn't have an engine, so what do you guys think I did? Went back to the scrapyard, right? Aluminum is at about a dollar a pound. And so I bought three busted engines, went to the library, for you guys it could be YouTube, figured out how to rebuild them, and so with three engines I made one good working engine. And so I was able to basically get a running go-kart for about 15 or 20 bucks. And so that's just because I had a vision as a kid your age, I dreamt big, I figured out ways to get around not having money. Because I learned to rebuild this go-kart, I also learned in the engine there's something called a, a governor that keeps it from exploding by running too fast. But I basically wired around the governor so I could turbo boost. So this thing could go up to about 50 miles an hour for about two seconds before the engine exploded. And then I'd shut it down and coast back down to a safe speed. But if you guys have a dream, and you have a way to figure it out, you can visualize it and you can make it happen. So then another funny thing is if you go around the house, vacuum cleaners can blow, right? They go, they can suck or blow. So I figured out that if you could take a garbage bag or anything to fill it up with that air, you can pick stuff up. So with a garbage bag, you can pick up like a table, a couch, a refrigerator, your parents, but you can actually go bigger. And so with a tarp I got from the neighbor for free, fold it over, stitch it together with wire so it stays together and then use duct tape to make it airproof, you can actually make a, a fall bag, like a stunt man. And so I started jumping off the roof onto my airbag. The problem is, is pushing the limit. I decided I was gonna go face first one day, but it ripped the seam from there to there. Face first into the ground, almost broke my nose and my jaw. So I learned then you need to use really strong materials. But, Again, if you can think it, you can do it, right? And so that's the next lesson I want you guys to learn is that if you have dreams, and you guys all told me your dreams, right? Most of you. 
protect those dreams. So a lot of adults in your life who learn to let go of their dreams are gonna tell them they're stupid, aren't they? So like my brother, people at school, other people were like, why are you doing that? That's weird. And I was always like, but I, you know, I've dreamt of it, I'm gonna make it happen. And so for you guys, hopefully if you have a dream, you protect it and you try and make that happen in the future. Because if you will listen to the other people and thought oh, it's stupid, guess what? Is that gonna ever happen for you? Nope. It's not gonna happen. But if you protect your dreams in the future, you can make them happen. And so I like to think of a life as a tree, right? So we're all growing our personal tree. So if you stay on the main trunk, you're building your knowledge, right? But if anybody, we all make decisions, right? And every time you make a decision, think of it as a branch. And so when you make a decision, are you going off in this branch? Or are you staying on that trunk where you keep learning and keep developing? And if you think about it, at your age, you're kind of down at the bottom, you're building that base of that tree, right? If you make a really dumb decision right now, like trying drugs, skipping school, you're gonna come off that main trunk pretty quick, aren't you? If you come off that trunk, what are you gonna become? A sucker, huh? Isn't that weird? That's what they're called if they're growing at the base of a tree. But if you make the right decisions, every time you think, well, you know, that's not a good decision, I'm gonna stay where I'm at, stay on that trunk of learning, developing new skills, you can keep growing that tree until you get to the top. What's that called? So I hope you guys, whenever you're hanging out with people and they're doing something maybe stupid, you think about it and go, wait a minute, do I want to grow off and become a sucker? Or do I not want to do what they're doing and maybe stay on my own path, learning and building my own future to become a leader? Does that make sense? So I hope you guys think of your life as a tree. And every time something pops up, think about it and go, is that a dumb decision? Do I want to be a sucker here? And if you can say no to going off with the kids that are experimenting with bad stuff, you can stay on that tree of life and become a leader. And this is interesting because we all have found, you guys and all of us, that basically whoever you hang out with is kind of who you're going to become. Do you know that? So you probably want to surround yourselves with people that are going in the direction that you want to go in. Does that make sense? So if you're hanging out with people that are trying alcohol or maybe trying to smoke, where do you think they're going to end up? Probably in trouble, huh? Where do you think you're going to end up if you're hanging out with that group of people? And so what I learned when I was about your age is I was hanging out with some kids like that, and I realized I can't do that. So I told them, look, I like you guys, but you're, hanging in, you're going in a direction I want to go in. And so I actually had to basically separate myself from friendships that were kind of destructive. And I surround myself now with the people that I want to go in the direction. So I surround myself with really smart people. I'm typically the dumbest one in the group, but they're the ones that are helping lift me up and take me in the direction I want to go. And so hopefully you guys realize that and start surrounding yourself with the people that you want to become. Does that make sense? So that's huge, right? Because you always hear about a friend who got in trouble. He didn't want to be there, but he was. And that way, you know, he basically became a sucker. Then you also hear these people that are hanging out with these really amazing kids doing some amazing stuff. And just by being near them, they get to be part of that. So hopefully you guys surround yourself with those important people to drag you in the positive direction, huh? Cool. So luckily, I was able to get into college, not because my grades were good, they weren't, but because I was swimming. We were swimming about four and a half, five hours a day. Does that sound like much? Yeah. And we're doing that about six days a week. So I was almost 30 hours in the water. You think I could have done more actual physical work in the water? That's pretty much as much as you can do, huh? Yeah. The worst week we swam about 60 miles. So I realized then that if I wanted to compete against other people, they're doing about 30 hours in the water as well. So the best way was then to start training my mind. So if you guys can visualize stuff, you can actually start making it happen, huh? So the people that told me that want to be the athletes, even the ones that want to become architects or do other things, you might want to start thinking about it first and start building those ideas. So nowadays, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I think about is what am I going to try and develop in the future? When I go to bed at night, I start thinking about those same things. When I was swimming, before I went to bed, I visualized my perfect race. When I woke up, I visualized my perfect race. And I did that enough that even though I was training as much as possible, the mind was helping things happen. So this is collegiate nat national, so that's about as far as you can go in college. But I basically accidentally won nationals 
because of visualizing every day what I wanted to become. And I visualized this for four years. I found a shark costume at Goodwill. So my only goal was to make top three at nationals just so I could be on the award stand wearing a shark costume. But because I didn't really care about any of the other people, I just visualized it every day, every morning, every night. When I got into the water, I wasn't paying attention to people. So kind of like being that loser, I wasn't trying to race anybody else. And by doing that, and by visualizing, I swam the fastest my body had ever swum. Lucky for me, that was also the fastest in the nation that year. So the cool lesson there was, if you visualize and you focus on your own path, typically that's gonna be the best, best path for you in the world, isn't it? And by then you'll be some of the best people at doing what you are that you wanna do. And so lessons from those are independent losers win, right? You're basically going to be the people that invent the new things of the world. If you set goals and you're dedicated, you can make all those dreams come true. And so focus on those things, hang out with the right people, and if you can do that, you'll head in those directions you want to do. Visualization is huge. Do you guys know what visualization is? So I've thrown that word around a bit, but what is it? But do you need anything? Do I need a special bowl? Do I need a special chair? I don't need anything, huh? So if you guys want to start picturing these dreams and making them come true, all you got to do is sit, don't you? Sit down and picture exactly what it is you want to be doing. That's all visualization is. You can do it in the middle of a dark room. You can do it sitting on a bus. You can do it sitting outside. So it's something you guys can work on whenever you have nothing else to do, huh? But focus on those dreams and make them come true. And the crazy thing I found is that if you get good at all this stuff, it comes quick. And so all of a sudden, these goals that you guys just told me can happen a lot quicker than you ever imagined. And so then you start going, hey, I'm gonna challenge myself. What can I do? I just, that, that was too easy. What's the next thing? And so hopefully you guys learn how quickly you can make these positive things in your life come true. And so for me, and I think most people, education is growing that tree as tall as it can possibly be, huh? And so I like to think of as education is king. And so here I have a picture of a castle and in education, you're basically building something, right? You're building your own knowledge, your castle knowledge. So do you guys want to build a, a castle on mud or quicksand? No. What do you want to build your big castle on? A solid foundation. Solid foundation. So where are you guys in this pyramid? Seven through, Seven through 12. So you're kind of near the foundation, aren't you? And so you guys just got out of sixth grade. So hopefully, if you guys are learning everything you can by your teachers, you're going to keep that foundation solid, aren't you? Yeah. But I like to think of it as a pyramid because as you learn more and more, there's less and less to learn, huh? Because you're learning stuff that people don't even know yet. And so I like to think of it as an opportunity of an upside down triangle. So as you learn more and more in school, the unknowns grow. And those unknowns actually turn into really cool opportunities. And so I just finished a PhD and so I'm learning things all about the world that nobody else knew before. And the cool thing is, is if you can start learning new things and bringing them to the public, science will actually pay you guys to answer these questions. Isn't that crazy? So if you can build your tree of knowledge so you're at the top of your pyramid, all of a sudden you guys get to be the ones that answer the questions and make all that money because nobody else knows the answers. So if you can stay in school and build that tree of knowledge for yourself, all of a sudden you can do anything you want. So hopefully you guys realize that and you start paying close attention to your teachers and learning as much as possible. So the next thing I thought, you know, I got my college education, then I wanted to travel the world. You guys ever heard of couch surfing? Yeah. Who's ever heard? So couch surfing is when you have a buddy in some other place and you say, hey, can I sleep on your couch while I'm there? Basically you have a free place to stay, right? So it's called couch surfing because you're basically using people's couches to get around the world. So I wanted to go travel the world, but did you think I have much money? No. I was, I'm still broke. I was always broke. So I had to figure out ways to get people to actually pay for me to go around the world and travel. Well, the coolest thing is, is if you get good enough in it and you've learned enough and you're educated, people will actually pay for you to go do research or help them do research. And so one researcher actually said, hey, I need your help in Tibet and China. So they needed to collect some mud samples and they needed somebody that could swim somebody that could hike long distances and help them collect lake muds. Does that sound like fun? Yeah. So let's show you guys where Tibet is. So this is where we are now, right? So 
So to go to Tibet, you basically have to go all the way over here between India and China. Do you guys know about what's going on between India and China geologically? So geologically, and this is what gets me really excited, is that India is like a freight train heading north and it's slamming into China. And that collision is creating the highest mountains in the world. Do you guys know the highest mountain in the world? Who said it? Nice. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. So what's crazy though is if you took this back millions of years, right? Where India wasn't even running into China yet, what do you think was in between the two? Flat Not flat land. Water. Farther than that. If I took India and I yanked it down here, what was between the two? Water. So think about this. Trick question. What do you think the rocks are made out of on the top of Mount Everest? Not water. Stone. What's stuff in the stone? Has to do with what was between India and China. Not water. What's in the water? Not just sand, but fossils and mud from the bottom of the ocean. Isn't that crazy? So if you go to the tip of Mount Everest, you're going to find fossils that were swimming, you know, these things were swimming around the ocean like 60 million years ago. And so the research was actually trying to figure out how quickly this occurred for that elevation to get, you know, thrown up into the sky. And so what we did is we went around and we collected lake muds. The problem is we had this breaker bar that we had to break through the ice because this whole area, it's a giant flat plateau, but it's 15,000 feet above sea level. So about twice as high as Mount Lemmon. The problem is we dropped that breaker bar through the ice. So somebody had to dive down and get it. So you guys want to see a video of that? So the challenge here is, so I challenge you guys to see if you can hold your breath for the same length. So start breathing. I'm going to tell you when to hold your breath. Don't die on me. But the challenge is if you can hold your breath while we dive down to get this breaker bar. You ready? Here we go. So start breathing. I'll tell you when to hold your breath. Luckily we have about a 40 pound weight and the hole was finished before it was dropped. Keep breathing. We have plenty of helpers. They're going to help get me down and hopefully they'll get me out of this hole. Here goes nothing. Okay, hold your breath now. They think I'm committing suicide, so they're running away. me yelling at how cold it is since it's right at freezing. So it's 30 feet underwater and then there's about six feet of muck that the thing sunk into. So you got to sift through all the muck. How many people are still in their breath? Got about 10 of you. Nice, nice. Keep it up. Find the breaker bar. Now it's got to get out. You know, we got to get out of the hole in the ice. But now I can't find the hole. Who made it? Nice work. I'm going to have to take you guys to Tibet next time, huh? Because I was telling everybody I want to travel the world, you know, and I let everybody know, I was sending emails out and stuff. Another professor was like, you know what? I need somebody kind of stupid like you who's interested in traveling the world. And I was like, oh, that's me. So the idea was, is the lab that I now work in looks at these tiny little grains called zircon. So have anybody heard of the fake diamond rings called cubic zirconia? Yeah. Everybody's heard of those? So they're a naturally occurring mineral called zircon. So the heavier one is filled with about a million zircons. The lighter one is normal dirt. So I'm going to pass these around. But the cool thing is, is because zircon is so much denser, you can use a gold pan. And instead of gold, zircon sinks to the bottom. But the project was to travel. And I started with South America on a motorcycle. But the idea was to collect sand around the entire continent to see exactly what the ages of the mountains are. Because the zircons come from the mountains and then the rivers break them down and take them to the ocean, don't they? So the idea was with enough of these samples, we could figure out the age of all of the stuff on the entire continent of South America. Does that make sense? So just traveling around on a motorcycle collecting sand and then we can figure out what ages all these mountains formed with these zircons. 
So got a bike off of Craigslist. Kind of sounds like a motorcycle or a go-kart story, doesn't it? Yeah. Chopped it up, basically put it in a box and shipped it to Peru, so right there, and then started the adventure. So that's what it looked like going around South America. How's that look? Cool. Kind of looks like a bum on two wheels, huh? So the cool thing was, is this with the groceries, that was a gallon of water, all my clothes and the laptop, spare tires, and then there was a gas can there for six gallons of gas, spare, and then all my tools, and then all my parts on the other side, and then all the camera gear on the front. So basically it had everything necessary. It broke down, had all the spare parts, could rebuild the bike there. So it was pretty fun traveling all over South America. The first picture you're gonna see is up here in Venezuela. So it was tropical. You guys see where the equator is right there? Where? So if it's the equator, it's really warm, huh? Yeah. So collecting samples there was like sitting in a bathtub. That pan is the one you guys are passing around. And that sample of zircon is actually what I got out of this river just by shaking that pan. So this would take about an hour. The problem was, is to collect the whole continent, right? That was up here. I needed to get a sample down there. Does that look very cold down there? Yeah. Freezing. In fact, 50 to 60 mile an hour side winds all the time because there's no other land to block it. And how close is that to Antarctica? It's the closest thing there is, huh? Look at Africa doesn't go that far, Australia doesn't go that far, so super close down there. And so down that far, that's what it looked like trying to collect sand. So I'd have to scooch out to get fresh water without falling through the ice. Then I'd have to chip out frozen sand or I'd have to melt that ice and so what took an hour up north took all day to melt it and pan it down to, to what you guys are passing around. So that's what you guys are passing around. So that's what the zircon looks all magnified. But typically these grains are so tiny, they're about the width of your human hair. Does that sound like it's very big? No. It's not big at all, huh? But the cool thing is with new technologies in our lab, we can actually blast one of those with a laser and get the age of that grain. So we can figure out how many millions of years ago that grain formed in a mountain before it was broken down by the rivers and taken down into the ocean. So it's really powerful technique. So this is on top of the Andes in a lake. Is that ice? That's sand. It's not sand. It's not, it's not ice. It looks like snow, but snow doesn't break like that, does it? What's another guess? It's super dry there. In fact, if you had a humongous, large French fry, you would love this place. Salt. Salt, exactly. So it's so dry, as soon as it rains, and it breaks down rock, that salt gets in the water, and then the water evaporates, doesn't it? And it gets trapped in these dry lake beds. So that's the top of the Andes. This was down near the southern tip. But all in all, every little yellow dot, you can see a sample collected. So about 300 rivers over seven months. Does, does that look like fun? Yeah. How many of you guys would sign on to do that? About half of you to, to do this on a motorcycle collecting sand? You'd go for it? So that's what's crazy though, is if you guys stay in school, you get good grades, and you show that you can do it, all of a sudden people will actually come looking for you to do such a thing. So I did all this stuff and I thought, what's next? I thought, I want to be on TV. So what do you guys think I did to start? What was the first thing I started doing? What's that? Nice work. Got to start thinking about it, huh? As I started visualizing, how could I get on TV? What could I do? You know, who do I talk to? What are the steps? Well, the, the perfect moment appeared. I noticed it. I applied. Basically got to host a show about geology and do eight shows around the world. So what you guys saw in that video were a couple of those around Iceland, Colorado, Greece, you name it. And then finally got to compete in Mythbusters. You guys ever heard of Mythbusters? Yeah. yeah. So you guys want to see a little quick s snippet of that show? Yeah. yeah. So for this, the challenge was, probably one of the funnest challenges out of eight shows was, could we take a water heater, remove two small safety features and turn it into a rocket engine, and then could you use that rocket engine water heater to shoot somebody up high enough that they could then safely parachute back to Earth? All right, here we go. We're leaving about 20% of air at the top of this tank, so we have a little bit of room, so as the water's heating up, it can expand and also build a bunch of steam pressure so that when the bottom of this tank ruptures, we have almost 100,000 pounds of force driving this straight up in the air. But just then, the pressure in this tank drops 
and then most of that water flashes to steam, adding even more propulsion. I'm really excited today, and it cracks me up. It takes me back to when I was a kid with a water bottle rocket, tiny schoolyard, three idiot friends, but now it's a bigger rocket, bigger yard with three idiot friends. What do you think is going on in Buster's head right now? Just a bunch of fiberglass epoxy. <laughs> 105, it was accelerating a lot faster than our gravity, wasn't it? So that head actually became about 2,000 pounds. And even though we had used a quarter inch steel cable, it snapped that because it couldn't hold the weight of the head. Do you guys think our neck is stronger than a quarter inch cable? No. So you think we would survive such a thing? No. No, I think our head would fall off too. But I basically got fired on live television. So now I'm back here talking to you guys. They just went with the other two guys. You guys want to see the ending? Here it is. Our final new Mythbuster is John. So didn't get chosen. But you think that's going to stop me? No. No way that's not going to stop me. So still working on stuff today. So the big question is, how do you guys start working on your dreams? So you guys tell me, visualize. So how, what do you guys need to visualize? Nothing, just dreams, right? Just need to start focusing. What else do you do? Set your dreams, your goals, you visualize. What else? Start practicing, don't you? And who do you hang out with? Hang out with your good friends going in the directions you want to go in, right? And then what about education? Stay in school and get the best grades you can, huh? Because you're, all your parents have jobs, right? Yeah. What are your jobs right now? School. 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 Your job right now is learn as much as you can so that when your parents retire, you can take care of them, huh? That's what I'm trying to tell my daughter. You think it's going to work? No. Yeah. So hopefully you guys got some ideas today. So the idea is that Keep your dreams protected. Don't let anybody tell, them that, tell you that they're stupid and work towards making those dreams a reality, all right? <laughs> 